Good morning, uh, everyone, and um, good afternoon and good evening from um, other parts of the world. Uh, I'm Ji Hye Kim, assistant professor uh, at the School of Art uh, at the University of Arizona. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the online symposium, Photography in Southeast Asia, History and Practice. This is the third installment of our symposia series on Asian photography, following the symposium of Korean photography this February and another on Taiwanese photography this April. The symposium is brought to you by Arizona Arts, School of Arts Center for Creative Photography, University of Arizona, as an ongoing series of a symposia on Asian photography. photography. Before we start uh, today's program, I want to share some uh, acknowledgments. Uh, we respectfully acknowledge that the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous people. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes with uh, Tucson being home to the, uh, to the old, old, old dam and the Yaku. I also would like to thank my colleagues at the Art History Program, School of Art, and the Center for Creative Photography uh, who helped to organize this wonderful event. Photography in Southeast Asia is intertwined with colonial history of the region, with European photographers opening their studios in local cities. The Scottish photographer John Thompson op operated a studio in Singapore from 1862 to 1868, making extensive visits to other parts of the region, such as Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand. The German photographer Gustav Lemberg and his firm GR Lemberg and Corporate served the Thai and Johor courts, opening branches in Singapore, Sumatra, Bangkok, and the Kuala Lumpur from the late 19th century to the early 20th century. The French photographer Emile Gazelle ran his studio successfully in Saigon after banning the commission for the exploration of the Mekong from 1866 to 1868. The, oriental, the orientalizing gaze of the Western photographers excuse me, continued in the post-colonial period, as can be seen in photographs of um, Indonesian women by Joseph Breitenbach and Henri Cartier-Bresson and photographs of a Thai traditional dancer by Jermaine Crow. What were other trajectories of 19th century photography in Southeast Asia? What impact did the Vietnam War have on photographic practices in Asia? How have diasporic communities been engaging with photographic culture in the region? How does photography intervene in political events in the region as well? The symposium aims to address various ways in which photography and history have structured the imaginary of Southeast Asia. We invited scholars, photographers, and curators to join the collaborative endeavor to diversify and decolonize the discipline of photography and its history. I hope you could join all the sessions today. For some housekeeping notes, throughout the symposium, when you want to ask a question during the Q&A portion of the program, please type your question uh, into the Q&A box. Now, I'm delighted to introduce Colin Blakely, who gives opening remarks. Colleen Blakely currently serves as director of the School of Art at the University of Arizona. He currently serves on the board of directors for the National Council of Arts Administrators. And until recently, he was the associate vice president of four strategic initiatives of Arizona Arts. Colleen is a pro photographer whose works have been shown at PhotoFest Houston, the Society for Contemporary Photography, the Pingyao International Photography Festival, the Griffin Museum of Photography, and the Photographic Center Northwest and the Jan Beckman Gallery. He received his MFA in photography from the University of New Mexico. Please welcome Colleen Blakely. Thanks, Jihei. Good morning, everyone, or 
Good afternoon or good evening, depending on uh, where you're joining us from. I am uh, delighted on behalf of the School of Art, uh, Arizona Arts and the University of Arizona to welcome you all to the Southeast Asia History and Practice Symposium. Um, I want to begin by, by first of all, uh, offering thanks to CCP and all the staff who have brought this symposium to fruition, uh, but in particular, Meg Jackson, Jackson Fox, who has been an essential partner of Hayes in the planning and execution of the symposium. Between the strength over all of our art history program at the University of Arizona, as well as its dedicated focus in the history of photography, as led by Dr. Kim, the amazing unmatched resources and work being done at the Center for Creative Photography, our number three ranked studio photography program, and the larger ecosystem of internationally recognized galleries and other photography related resources in our broader community, Tucson is an exciting locus of activity with respect to the medium of photography and its history. Thus, even though it is virtual, I hope you will find the University of Arizona a fitting host for this symposium and the ones that have preceded it. Uh, I also hope that at some point, if you have not already, you'll find uh, opportunity to visit the uh, wonderful city of Tucson and, and the University of Arizona in the future. In addition to the photography infrastructure of the University of Arizona uh, and Tucson, the positioning of this symposium also ties directly into the broader vision of our arts infrastructure on campus. In response to a university strategic plan that foregrounds the arts as a vital component of the university identity, three years ago, the new division of Arizona Arts was created on campus. This division brings together into a single organizational structure, the arts academic units, of which the School of Art is obviously one, and the engaging and presenting units, which include both the Center for Creative Photography and the University of Arizona Museum of Art. Doing so not only makes collaboration easy, easier, it also instills a sense of shared purpose and vision in thinking about the impact the arts can have. I think the symposium serves as a perfect example, both of the collaboration and the broader impact represented by Arizona arts. Our telling of history is an ongoing work in progress. And at the base of this process is a fundamental question about what stories get told and by whom. Because the histories with which a society becomes familiar ultimately reflect the work of dominant voices within that society, it is incumbent upon us, especially in academia, to interrogate and ultimately expand on and add new perspectives to those histories. So when Jihei began work on this broader initiative uh, that this symposium is part of, that is exactly what she intended to do. Um, the idea from my perspective was simple and yet at the same time, wildly ambitious. It was to develop and launch a series of symposia around Asian photography that would bring together voices from the East and West in dialogue around that topic. I have to say I was immediately impressed by the ways in which Dr. Kim, at that time only her, in her third year on the faculty, was already thinking broadly about the impact she wanted to have on her discipline. She was of course doing that through her scholarship with one book con under contract um, and another on the way. However, with these symposia, I think she's not just thinking in terms of an individual research agenda, but how to be a catalyst for a broader body of knowledge and equally important, the creation of communities around that body of knowledge. This is really not something that can be accomplished through a single activity or event. It requires sustained effort. Uh, and as such, it is an effort on multiple levels that I applaud. Nor is this something that can be accomplished alone. Building communities require broad participation. And so while I certainly wanna recognize Jihei and Meg for their work leading this endeavor, I also want to recognize and thank all of you all with us today who have been active participants in this community. You are collective contributors to something I sincerely believe will have important consequences. This symposium, is, as Jihei mentioned, is the third installment with the first focusing on Korea and the second on Taiwan. And I suspect many of you all have participated in all three. My sincere hope is that this won't be the last symposium or related event uh, or community gathering for that matter. And knowing what I do about Meg and Jihei's drive and determination, I suspect it will not be. So um, thanks again for attending, welcome. And uh, I'm delighted to turn it back over to Jihei.
Jihei, you're still muted. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you so much, Colin. Um, and now we are moving to our um, keynote speech. And I'm glad to introduce uh, my colleague, Jack Mac Jackson Fox, who will introduce the keynote speaker. Uh, Mac Jackson Fox currently serves as curator of interdisciplinary and community practices at the Center for Creative Photography at the University of Arizona. Prior to that, Jackson Fox was assistant professor of global contemporary art at the University of, De uh, at the University of Denver. Jackson Fox holds PhD in contemporary art and critical theory from the University of Arizona. Thanks, over to you. Thank you, Jihei. And I will echo the thanks to all of you who are joining us today live and a warm hello to those who will be watching portions of our symposia later. Um, on behalf of CCP, we also extend our deepest gratitude to Dr. Jihei Kim, a wonderful colleague and collaborator and friend uh, who invited us to be a part of this series of symposia on photography in Asia. And, you know, kind of just, again, um, echoing Colin as well, that this is such a vital and rewarding project, and it's such an honor to participate in these symposia alongside all of you and uh, in partnership with the University of Arizona School of Art and Arizona Arts, and we're just so grateful to be here. So with that, I'm honored to be introducing our keynote speaker as the foundation on which today's symposia will be built, Dr. T. Fu, Distinguished Professor of Race, Diaspora, and Visual Justice at the University of Toronto, Scarborough. After completing her PhD at the University of California, Berkeley, and a Mellon postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Toronto, she joined Western University, where for more than a decade, she taught courses on visual studies, cultural theory, and Asian North American culture. Her research in public humanities practice examines the intersections between media studies, diaspora and migration, vision and justice, and she's author of two monographs, Picturing Model Citizens, Civility in Asian American Visual Culture, and Warring Visions, Vietnam and Photography. She has also co-edited three volumes, Feeling Photography, Refugee States, Critical Refugee Studies in Canada, and the forthcoming Cold War Camera. Dr. Fu is also director and PI of the Family Camera Network, a SSHRC funded collaborative research project, which partners with arts organizations and educational institutions to engage local communities in the building of an anti-racist public archive through the collection and preservation of family photographs and their stories. In 2017, she was elected as member of the College of New Scholars, Artists and Scientists at the Royal Society of Canada. She is co-editor of the peer-reviewed International Journal of Trans-Asia Photography and has held visiting positions at the Asia Research Institute at the National University of Singapore and Yale University. Dr. Fu, we're so grateful that you were able to join us and are looking very much forward to your keynote, Warring Visions, Photography Across Southeast Asia. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just... I'm just going to put up the PowerPoint in case I forget. Um, can you see it? Yes. Great. Thank you for this warm and gracious welcome, uh, Meg and Jihei. I am honored to share my work with all of you who have joined this event hosted by the Center for Creative Photography and the School of Fine Arts at the University of Arizona. I look forward to a lively discussion in this, the third of a three part symposium series. I take the title of this event, uh, Photography in Southeast Asia, as an invitation and provocation. The other two symposia had perhaps more clearly defined parameters, Korea and Taiwan respectively, can be broached through a framework of the nation state, however fraught, messy, and contested. Southeast Asia clearly cannot be construed through such a framework. The term Southeast Asia was coined in the 19th century in the course of colonial exploration, received official endorsement during World War II with the deployment of the Pacific Theater of War, and evolved further during the Global Cold War. How might we re-examine photography through Southeast Asia? And what resources and methods equip us to reconsider Southeast Asia through the lens of photography? Indeed, the context for the emergence and consolidation of Southeast Asia mired as it is in the geopolitical turmoil of colonialism and Cold War militarization, means that the task of tracing the histories of Southeast Asian photography 
requires attending to questions of power. In my work on Vietnam's visual histories, I look at photography through war as an analytic. Um, photography is an analytic and actually war is an analytic because of the pervasiveness of conflict in Southeast Asia and Asia more broadly. To make this observation is not to assert that war is endemic to Asia or that Asia should be construed in reductively martial terms. I take the point of many critics in um, Vietnam studies that Vietnam is a country and not a war. But I make this observation in order to emphasize the condition of perpetual warfare as a global phenomenon whose far reaching consequences are still being lived and felt. The condition of perpetual war has shaped and reimagined Southeast Asia, whether in the shadow of imperial ambition or in hope of revolutionary transformation or in allegiance to the dream of post-colonial independence or an uneasy combination of all three. This is manifest from the colonial era to the great wars of the 20th century to the so-called post-war period, a misnomer given how hot the Cold War erupted in proxy battlegrounds in the global South, most notably in Vietnam, in Laos and Cambodia. This is manifest in events that are not recognized as wars at all, but instead are described in terms of conflict, action, operation, or as the case with uh, Malaysia emergency. So as a starting point, it's important to take seriously the imposition of an imperial eye, which starting in at least the 19th century surveyed territory, making land and water knowable and navigable and people legible and manageable to colonial administrators. As has been well documented, photography developed in tandem with the projection of colonial aspiration, which was manifest visually in images that evinced the pleasures of consumerism which were by no means separate from ethnographic voyeurism. Evidence of the imperial eye abounds in the colonial archive. And you might be familiar with some of these images, but those made by Emile Dizal, for example, detail adventures accompanying French soldiers, indeed as an enlisted soldier himself. Um, they offer in, insight on the workings of power. Seeing through the eyes of photographers, soldiers, travelers, and administrators, who are sometimes all of these simultaneously, risks affirming their visions of empire. How might we see otherwise? Taking inspiration from critics who call for an engagement with archives against the grain, for more than a decade, my own work on photography in the war in Vietnam has sought to reckon with the colonial archive, as well as to look for other visual resources. So I began, so I begin with the with two versions of how photography came to Vietnam. It is perhaps fitting that historians should be split on the story of photography's emergence in Vietnam, given the ways that the nation itself has been divided, um, divided in um, different visions of how the resistance against French colonial, colonialism should unfold, or that against American imperialism. Historian Nguyen the pit offers one account relayed by scholar Ellen Takata. In this account, French photographer Alphonse Jules Etier's voyages with diplomat Théodore de la Gane resulted in some of the first photographs of Vietnam, specifically Da Nang, a port city in Vietnam's central region, where Etier took photographs of um, Vietnamese soldiers and of the landscape. And as mentioned earlier, Emile Giselle set up the first um, commercial photograph um, studio in Saigon in 1860. So Nguyen Du Kit's story about photography's emergence in Vietnam emphasizes photography's status as a French invention and as its utility for advancing French colonialism. In this account, the development of commercial photography supports and is thoroughly implicated in processes of exploitation and extraction. A second account credits uh, Dan Quy Tru, a Mandarin uh, under Emperor Tu Duc, for bringing photography to Vietnam um, in 1865, um, and approximately 1865. And this is just a photograph of a statue that was uh, fairly recently unveiled to mark some of the contributions of this um, eminent um, person. So in 1865, Drew embarked on a state visit to China where he bought a camera, developed film, he shot there and persuaded a Chinese photographer to engage in a joint business venture. 
They returned to Hanoi, where in 1869, they opened the first Vietnamese owned commercial studio. So it's, this uh, account is unmistakably nationalistic in which uh, the emergence of Vietnamese photography according to this story emphasizes the role of an enterprising Vietnamese photographer. So he may have acquired his expertise in equipment from China, Vietnam's main rival, then he do successfully adapted both for local uses. Um, these diverging tales of photography's path to Vietnam share a common concern with the challenges technology posed as a foreign innovation and commodity to national self-fashioning and a nascent anti-colonial consciousness. I find the second version of the story particularly resonant for it saw photography's threat, at least in the form of French colonialism, by crediting China as at that time a less threatening source of um, this introduction to the emerging nation. By contrast, the first version spells out the principal obstacle for Vietnamese patriots. To enlist photography towards the end of anti-colonial resistance, these patriots needed to overcome France's corrupting influence. They had to adapt a French instrument for Vietnamese purposes. And so they remade it in kind of an, a Vietnamese image. As Karen Strasser argues in her study of Indonesian modernity, popular photography is national and transnational. Practitioners adapt foreign technologies to create idioms to express local desires, to fashion what Strasser describes as refracted vision, ways of seeing specific to a local context while also inseparable from the geopolitical context that also shapes this nation a similar framework for how to see developed in Vietnam. From 1865 through to the mid 20th century, however, commercial studios catered largely to the desires of a bourgeois class who could afford to commission their likenesses. Salon photography, which is a focus of other Southeast Asian uh, critics and scholars, um, is characterized by its indulgence of decadent bourgeois tastes and it flourished during this era. The question of how photography could serve revolutionary ends on the other hand, would not be posed explicitly until well into the 20th century. During the war in Vietnam, which is a kind of specific focus of my book, Vietnamese photographers began testing in earnest the camera's capacity to represent their struggles, to broker their political position and to establish solidarities with other organizations. Critics often recognize this war as a watershed in visual history, given its immense appeal for photojournalists from around the world whose work uh, resulted in some very familiar iconic images such as these here, not just made by and for the US, but also um, the contributions of uh, photographers from Japan, such as Kyoichi um, Kawada and elsewhere. My book focuses on an even less well-known story, which is the story of the contribution of Vietnamese photographers to this visual history. In 1968, for example, Nguyen Nhan Den and Nguyen Nhok Han documented the course of this war and its toll on soldiers and civilians in South Vietnam, including their own coverage of the Tet Offensive in this book called Vietnam in uh, Koi Le, or Vietnam in Flames. And this is uh, the title of the image on the cover. Um, so their book was really focused on the coverage of the Tet Offensive and its aftermath. And this book was uh, commissioned by the government of Vietnam and printed in Hong Kong, a site likely selected because of scarce uh, local resources to publish. To my knowledge, this is one of the few surviving visual records of the fallen Saigon regime. The original title, Vietnam Khoi Le, which is um, li the literal English translation is Vietnam in Flames, is a phrase that refers to the book's overall theme of conflagration in the wake of the Tet Offensive. The phrase also stresses the photographer's distinctively Vietnamese perspective. Hoi Lu is the Vietnamese idiom for war. Their counterparts in the North, namely the Hanoi-based Vietnam News Agency, likewise dispatched photographers to produce images, also in hopes of reaching the masses. Based out of Hanoi, the VNA was founded in September 1945, uh, less than two weeks after Ho Chi Minh issued his declaration of independence, announcing the sovereignty of the newly formed Democratic Republic of Vietnam. During his time in Paris uh, in the early 20th century, Ho Chi Minh, then known as Nguyen Ai Wok or uh, Nguyen the Patriot, worked for a time as a photo retoucher. 
And though little is known of his labors in this regard, it is tempting to surmise that his experience with photography enabled him to glimpse its revolutionary potential. One of the agency's first tasks in 1945, accordingly, was to broadcast news of the declaration widely, which promptly established it as a premier mouthpiece for the DRV. Vietnamese photographers who covered the American war relied on equipment made and supplied by communist allies or which were liberated from the enemies they captured. Communist allies provided cameras and lenses that were made in East Germany and the USSR and delivered to Vietnam via Hong Kong or over the Northern mountains bordering China, presumably along the same routes that Soviet made weapons um, were uh, pushed along. Photographers were dispatched for more instrumental purposes as well to make ID images to enable revolutionaries to pass through checkpoints in South Vietnam during an era when purportedly the CIA had signed a deal with Polaroid and was detaining anyone who lacked um, documents. The VNA established training programs for journalists and photographers who went on to produce images and stories that would promote their cause, recruit volunteers, and promote sympathy with anti-war organizations and other decolonizing movements. Despite scarce resources and rudimentary um, media infrastructure, the communist press sought to project a vision of socialist revolution through photography. During the war, three main groups were the ideal uh, audiences for this, these images. Within Vietnam, the North Vietnamese state deployed these images for purposes of persuasion to the revolutionary cause. The, um, in uh, jungle exhibitions, for example. The images circulated more broadly within the network of visual exchange that I briefly described um, earlier, particularly in exhibitions organized by communist bloc countries. Photographs were also distributed to foreigners um, beyond the communist bloc especially to members of anti-war organizations. So visitors to Hanoi who represented these anti-war organizations were also shown copies of photographs as part of an overall strategy on the part of the image savvy communist state to win their sympathy and to cultivate international solidarity. At their archives, the VNA um, still holds more than a dozen booklets with the label Gatayye Umho Vietnam or the entire world supports Vietnam which contains press images of anti-war protests from around the world. These, these photographers, these socialist photographers, these communist photographers shaped the socialist way of seeing as a process that entailed purifying the, the taint of French and bourgeois influence in photography um, and developing a style amenable to revolutionary ideals in a distinctly unapologetic way. According to Pham Tin Yung, a former photo editor at the VNA, the state's position was unequivocal. Um, while form mattered, ideological content took precedence. He explained in an interview with me that the basic nature of news photography includes um, for him the following five important elements, ideology, truthfulness, new currency, mass appeal, and last, um, last of all, uh, aesthetics. The VNA's history of photography outlines an additional five key themes that emerged in the post-1954 era um, when the French broke the yoke of French colonial, when, sorry, when the North broke the yoke of French colonial rule and the first photographers group organized exhibitions as events to reclaim photography for their own purposes. Specifically, these exhibitions stress the themes of socialist values, uh, which were expression of clarity, praise of national unity, honoring of country and people and building a friendship and world peace. Accordingly, this new form of photography presented two quintessentially revolutionary subjects, heroic sacrifice and the toil of laborers in fields and factories. Um, so these efforts on and off the battlefield were for the photographers crucial to the war effort. Taken together, these themes constitute um, the ideological foundation of revolutionary photography. Ideolo ideology informed the subject matter of these photographs and guided practitioners into what to look at, how to represent it, and how to instruct spectators to recognize what counts as revolutionary. However, as the, the VNA history of itself uh, emphasizes, a problem arose when, quote, the pictures that conveyed ideology were dry and lifeless, but beautiful pictures lacked the breath of the new life of communism. So um, 
while the VNA's explanation of its principles does not account for how precisely to balance ideology with aesthetics, a 1969 conference of patriotic photographers provided an answer. At this event, the participants urged photographers to abandon aesthetics in favor of more pressing political subjects. Um, the, the history book um, urges that there are those, or notes that there are those who have yet to renounce old habits and fool themselves by looking through distorted lenses in pursuit of beautiful subjects. By gone through our clear communist lenses, we will produce a new day. In short, socialist photography had to renounce aesthetics so that it could, it could adhere faithfully to ideological principles. If we look closely, however, we can discern that beauty slips back into the socialist picture. A key approach to invoking beauty was highly gendered. Through a focus on the representation of women and constructing this figure as a multi-form symbol of revolution. So women enter the visual field specifically when the theme of feminine beauty served to enliven the otherwise so-called dry and lifeless substance of revolutionary ideology. Um, and another way in which ide uh, aesthetics entered the picture was through the landscape. Photographs taken of roadwork and military operations along the Ho Chi Minh Trail and on the Zhong Sun mountain chain center the sublime landscape as a source and symbol of revolutionary resolve, endurance, and triumph. The focus on landscape was acceptable, it seems, so long as photographs established connection between this setting and collective struggle, as evident in the men and women who are most often portrayed working alongside each other and seldom announced in isolation. Though Vietnamese critics at early exhibitions then decried the stain of French influence as at best bourgeois and at worst a throwback to colonial ways of seeing, they did not, um, as these images show, wholly abandon aesthetics. Instead, by invoking the acceptable theme of nationalism rendered through pleasing forms of femininity and landscape, but, uh, Vietnamese photographers managed to reconcile form with ideological content. In these varied ways, revolutionary photography sought to correct the ideological distortions of a decadent bourgeois aesthetic, and in so doing, represent unrepresentable subjects deemed antithetical to the building of a new society. By amplifying the message of socialist uplift, photographers resolved the problem of bourgeois aesthetic, repudiating the decadence of a style associated with French colonialism. The visual record of revolution uneasily reconciles the contradictions of aesthetics and ideology. So, so far, um, my talk has emphasized socialist ways of seeing, and I just want to um, note that my larger book is concerned with photography in Vietnam, which I consider in terms of heterogeneous communities as not one Vietnam, but many Vietnams, North, South, and diasporic, just to name three. So, um, but even with this expanded uh, view that I take up in my book, I'm aware that my approach to Vietnam is not, and in indeed was not meant to be, a comprehensive account of Southeast Asian photography. Um, and in fact, I guess my book could be construed as somewhat still nationally bounded. Um, but since writing this book, I've been reflecting on um, kind of the potential ways in which the, the admittedly focused approach that I adapted uh, or adopted could be broadened to include more wide ranging insights. And also because I wanted to fulfill the brief of this symposium. So increasingly critics are acknowledging the global dimensions of the war in Vietnam. As Simeon Mann reminds us, quote, the Vietnam War is more than just a war between world powers, a contest between two ideological systems. Rather, in this war, the legacies of multiple colonialisms converged and were fought over by the soldiers and workers on the ground. From the perspective of the decolonizing Pacific, we can see, he argues, that the Vietnam War was a globe-spanning moment, one that mobilized various decolonizing nations and territories. So in his transnational history of militarization and the Vietnam War, Man provides an expansive account of soldiering as a form of labor that conscripts not just those in the armed forces, um, rather he contends soldiering is a form of labor that encompasses a broader category of people whose work and lives, he observes, become entwined with the military. So what does that mean for photography? 
uh, the longer story of the development of photography then can be construed as unfolding in ways un inseparable from the story of soldiering. We can glimpse some of this in the visual networks that facilitated socialist ways of seeing. The smuggling of cameras, lenses, and film through Hong Kong and China, the employment of Eastern Bloc expertise to train Vietnamese photographers, the routes by which images were then smuggled out, printed, and circulate to influence a fiercely divided public. This inextricable link between photography and militarization is also discernible in contexts where soldiering may not be obvious or visible. So consider the work of uh, Lung Pai Lu. I learned of her passion for photography from her adult children when they participated in the Family Camera, a project that I helped uh, co-direct, which collected domestic images and their stories as a way to trace visual histories of migration. Lung lived in Yatjang, Vietnam, and was an avid, talented uh, amateur photographer. At a time when equipment and film were scarce, she managed to indulge her hobby because of her family's connections to the US military. Her husband's business as a machinist with American uh, contacts meant that he had access to supplies at the PX, the post exchange. At a time when color film was difficult to access, never mind develop, Lung's collection includes a number of prints, thanks again to her family connections. Her husband prevailed upon his friends in the US military to take her color film with them on their rest and recuperate, uh, recuperation trips to Thailand to develop. So the visual culture of the war in Vietnam encompasses, if, if you turn to this archive, the personal of personal images and family photographs, you can see that this experience of war encompasses kind of the quotidian um, experiences which register on quieter frequencies beyond the violence, uh, the spectacle of violence. Such images offer insights on experiences of war, in other words, which are ordinary and not just spectacular. In my larger work, I consider the potential of such ordinary images to provide um, a more nuanced picture of Vietnam's story of the struggles to define the nation, to reckon with war, and to reconstitute communities in the wake of war. So while the scope of my book was necessarily limited to the story of Vietnam's visual culture, um, in the time uh, remaining to me, I'd like to briefly reflect on the implications of this work and how it might be taken up in even broader terms with Southeast Asia. And again, because this is a war that spills into neighboring countries, Laos, Cambodia, with the Democratic Republic of Vietnam carved out the Ho Chi Minh Trail under thick uh, jungle canopy, photography might then help us to delineate the ways that alliances were rendered visible and um, give rise to obfuscations and erasures in the wake of tensions um, that emerged between these three nations. As a communist Vietnamese state sought to project their account of revolution and liberation, the glare of the spotlight shone on Vietnam and its war cast a shadow over the experiences of its neighbors and allies, rendering them markedly less visible. Consider, for example, the symbol of the revolutionary woman whose image was projected internationally as a means of eliciting sympathy from anti-war activists and feminist organizations, most notably in events such as the Indo-Chinese Women's Conference hosted in Canada in 1970, which invited a delegation of women from Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam um, to speak about their experiences and to cultivate solidarities with um, anti-war activists from the North American um, uh, uh, organizations. Um, but it was interesting that this, these solidarities, these convergences um, found common ground, but not on equal terms. And this is most visible in the admission card at the Vancouver conference, which featured a rep reproduction of a famous photograph of a Vietnamese militia woman as an emblem of the overall proceedings. So this decision reveals the ways that the spotlight on Vietnamese women overshadowed the ocean and Cambodian perspectives to the point where when some of the delegates from Cambodia um, canceled due to political instability in, um, in the wake of a coup, um, their absence was barely noted. In 1979, in a less well-known chapter of this war, VNA photographers were deployed um, to Cambodia. So in, it's a war between uh, Vietnam and Cambodia, actually. And in their interviews with me, veteran, veteran photographers recalled that they were given Cambodian names 
and tasked with making photographs that were meant to project the Cambodian point of view, when in fact they advanced the Vietnamese narrative, the war's end in benevolent terms as a liberation from the Khmer Rouge and not as an invasion of C Cambodia. So in this manner, the Vietnamese state determined the political uh, framework by which Cambodia became visible after Pol Pot time when the Khmer Rouge imposed a sculptic regime of total surveillance and visual repression. Reflecting on the ways that US intervention in Laos unfolded as a series of covert operations, cultural critic Ma Vang contends that tracing histories of secrecy must grapple with archives on the run, records replete with erasures and redactions. Discourses about the war in Cambodia unfold through a peculiar form that Yidang uh, Chuang describes as the minor anecdote in which the archive is characterized by its paradoxical qualities, or as she compellingly puts it, Cambodia is there, yet not there, prominent and central, yet vacated of meaning. When it comes to the US state, um, the archives are replete with references to the war in Cambodia, but invoke not so much as a secret to be obscured and quieted as in the case of Lao, but rather as the most obscure and minor and inconsequential of the US military's Cold War foreign policy priorities, even as these policies unleashed a catastrophic amount of violence. These insights on the nature of this war and its ongoing aftermaths further underscore the difficulty that photo historians face in examining the visualities of Southeast Asia. It means surely reckoning with the absence of images, with that which has been disavowed, discarded, disappeared, and destroyed. My work on Vietnam offered one way of grappling with redaction in the chapter that, uh, in which I talk about a military album that had been renounced, which I found in um, uh, a, a shop in, in Saigon. I address erasure in a way that marks the objecting object, an object that objects to being looked at, so as to avoid, I hope, awkwardly patching a history where holes form a kind of project protection. In this symposium, I look forward to learning from the critics, artists, and curators gathered here who can provide further insights into the methods and approaches that might shed further light on the photographies of Southeast Asia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Fu for engaging, uh, for such an engaging start to the day's convening. Um, and as our audiences begin to submit their questions and thoughts in the Zoom uh, Q&A at the bottom of your screen and symposium participants, I hope you'll also feel free to raise your hand with questions. Um, I do have a question to begin. And so, you know, in the harnessing of the power of photography, this seems to me, uh, Dr. Fu, kind of a communist agenda. So by what you're describing, so in my studies of Soviet Russia and the Eastern Bloc and Yugoslavia and Cuba, you know, my research into these communist visual histories revealed that political leaders saw photography as a double-edged sword. So they were interested in deploying photography at the political level and were highly suppressing it at the popular level. And I'm curious if you found similar suppressions in popular photography in Vietnam, um, were political regimes concerned at all about the potential power of photography in the hands of the everyday person? Um, that's a, a really great question. Um, I think that one way of answering is just to really look back at the communist photographers' own histories of themselves. Um, they emphasize kind of social, of uplift as a predominant theme. And while they would not go right out and say that they um, repress or censor photographs, it was very clear that images that did not um, uh, support kind of the narrative of uplift were not shared during that era. So images of um, uh, death and injury um, that were suffered by uh, communist fighters were not circulated and it was only until recent, it was only recently that um, they were actually shown. However, images that were taken by the Western press of civilian injuries were widely, um, widely documented and shown. Um, so that gives you kind of uh, one example. And I think the official narrative to, to this day too is that, uh, is a denial that 
there were refugees um, mm -hmm. because, um, you know, the accepting that there was kind of that this, this massive um, uh, dislocation of um, Vietnamese people or ethnic Chinese as they prefer to label um, the exodus um, is as Yenle Espiritu um, pointed out, a, a continuation of the war beyond the war's end. And so um, recognizing that um, there was a resounding rejection of um, this, this victory and reunification um, would not align with kind of this history. So um, those are just two examples of this form of um, quiet suppression. Hmm. So we have one comment and it's um, from Ted Engelman who said, it is true Vietnam is a country, not a war. Now, if we can only get academics to spell Vietnam, at least two words along with hide and why, an educational and therapeutic process for Americans, especially. Here, here. <laughs> well, I, I could ask questions. <laughs> um, well, um, well, I have your book um, on my desk, but um, um, I'm pretty, uh, I'm more interested in like, because I'm also studying uh, vernacular photographic practices uh, in Asia, and also it's the relation to uh, militarism and the Cold War politics. So like, I wonder like uh, your uh, research and study or exploration of like vernacular photographic practices in Vietnam, like in terms of like, what kind, what level, what kind of tension it created uh, with uh, like widely circulated popular photographs of the war and the war experience. And especially considering that like, um, like Hany Kwan's book, like uh, Ghost of a War in Vietnam, he uh, noted that like within uh, many families uh, in Vietnam during the war, uh, both victims and inflictors are their family members altogether. So I wonder like the family albums and the vernacular photographs also reflect this kind of like layered and conflicting uh, experience of the war as well. So the last part of that question, if you don't mind repeating. Yeah, so like the, the, the family album you are looking at, even like military albums, like do they yeah. also convey this kind of like both the images of victims and inflictors of violence and at the same time, whether it creates, uh, uh, so like it challenges the dominant mode of uh, visualizing the war or whether it is uh, incorporating the popular uh, visual regime of the war. I mean, that's an, that's a great question and I I'm just really excited for kind of the the next generation of researchers to take up this question in earnest I didn't um, do the kind of um, uh, I think it was e it was easier in some ways to interview kind of the veteran photographers who actually have a public um, identity like um, a clear public identity in the state right now and a, a level of veneration um, that they're aware of and um, could enjoy. The story of um, like the two Vietnams um, is still a sensitive story uh, and, not some, and something that I think at the time because of my own family's history, I don't feel, I didn't feel that it, it was ready it was not yet a time for me to take on that kind of research um, to, to speak about um, the side that lost um, because there's not the official narrative is like everybody supported uh, this war, right? So um, you could tell, you can more easily speak to that in uh, interviews with the diaspora because they come from a different position and where um, kind of a declaration of where you're located in relation to the revolution is, is slightly different. Um, but I think it, it can be evident in the album. It, it can certainly be evident in the album. Um, while at the same time, 
I'm curious as to how many of those albums still contain pictures of people wearing South Vietnamese uniforms. Because this, the interviews that I've seen the people in the diaspora speak about removing those photos and destroying those photos. So if there's visual, if you're asking, is there a visual uh, evidence of that, um, of that vision, um, I think that more needs to be done in that respect. It seems to me that vernacular images, and maybe this is impossible, but that they could um, be a potential intervention in the visual representation of the history of Vietnam and during the war. Um, and I'm wondering if you're seeing these private images and the telling of these histories more often, or maybe that's what you're speaking to is that the next generation of scholars, like this could be the opportunity. Okay, so they're both an, an intervention and an and evidence. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what um, my book was trying to suggest that, um, you know, in the dearth of an official record of South Vietnam in the U.S. and uh, in Vietnam itself, we return to kind of the vernacular, to family images, in order to tell that particular kind of story. But the kind of the way in which you speak about that story, um, the con where you tell that story matters um, because of the sensitivity of these particular histories. I'm going to give you an example. Um, or just, I don't know, it's not really an example. I've been approached to ask whether I'd be open to having my book translated and circulated in Vietnam. And while that's exciting to me, um, I'm thinking, well, what, what's gonna happen to that chapter on refugees? Like, how mm -hmm. can I, how can that be done? And like, what part, which of those images, some of which are like my own family history, are they included in the book? Do I really want that in like, um, to be so evident, it's like one thing to just say what you wish to say in the comfort of Canada or the United or the relative comfort of the United States, where certain things can be spoken about. Um, but uh, you know, the, in uh, other places, um, there's a tacit understanding that one does not speak of such things, right? And you don't speak about refugees. Um, yeah. So I want to turn to some of the questions that we have um, regarding your insights about Vietnamese socialist imagery of women in landscapes. Do you find influence from Russian and Chinese imagery? That is a great question. <laughs> um, that that's a really great question, and in some parts, some, and my and it's not a deflection. It's an explanation of why I can't answer it. That's what motivated the Cold War camera project. Um, no single researcher can provide a comprehensive uh, visual account of the global Cold War and the circuits of influence. And one of the most um, um, fruitful events, like, and I look forward to more of this, it was um, one on kind of socialist realism that was held in China in which you know, some, a German expert came on board, a Chinese expert, uh, not so much a Russian in that context, but I think it was that those um, circuits of visual influence, that there are researchers starting to work on this, but it by no means has been com comprehensively or exhaustively um, uh, addressed. What I do know is like from a visual scan of these pictorials, there's like a Chinese China pictorial, there's a Korea pictorial, Vietnam pictorial, they resemble each other. I mean, so I want to say yes. Do I have evidence of that beyond kind of a visual scan? No, I just feel like there's more, like you can get the, the area scholars together and find kind of the editorial records and maybe there would be more to, to be done with this. When I went to the headquarters of Vietnam pictorial, and I asked to see their archive. All I got were like the old issues. Didn't get any kind of 
ed editorial, correspondence, no directive, nothing, just what you would see in a library. So that is a really great question. And I really look forward to other scholars being able to pursue those questions in depth. I have a question, if, if I may, actually about the landscape. Um, I was really fascinated by your description of the use of landscape in relationship to uh, social struggle, about how it became this background. Um, and I was wondering if there was uh, also an effort at a kind of uh, more to topographic description of landscape, or was it more of a kind of a rejection of that, uh, that, that approach to landscape, which could be seen as a carryover from the French tradition? Hmm. You know, the, the kind of aestheticization of the landscape as a carryover, is that what you're getting at? It's really hard to distinguish. I think it was almost like a reclamation, like a borrowing or um, a desire to claim Vietnam and, in, and to aestheticize Vietnam in a mode that made sense for patriots to try to take it away from kind of the, the, um, the fascination of, kind of the earlier generation of explorers. And so even while um, kind of their, um, fat, their attention to and um, fascination with landscape, the socialist photographers, um, might resemble it, they really thought to remake the land in their own mm -hmm. image. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the photographs that I was seeing, I mean, in the large, in the chapter on socialist ways of seeing, which turned to uh, Vietnam pictorial in one section, um, I noted that in passing that uh, there's also an attention to kind of the, the ethnic minorities um, and the different regions of Vietnam. And this is a way of bringing Vietnam together. It's through land and also an attention to kind of the, that might look like an, uh, what is it, the ethnographic attention, but really it was a desire to um, claim um, this diversity as part of a nation that they were mm -hmm. calling together. And that's what was, what I understand um, landscape to be not as an extension of French territory, but a reclamation of the beauty of Vietnam, which would be the inspiration, the name, uh, the inspiration for kind of their struggles. Mm. Thank you. So another question. Thank you for your stimulating talk. Do you know if there were photographic solidarities across the left in Southeast Asia? To your knowledge, were there, for instance, other similar leftist photographers documenting their own decolonization wars in Malaya or in Indonesia? Were there alliances or links to North Vietnamese? Are there archived, um, are there archived anywhere, even if on the run, quote, on the run? Hi, Chien. Um, thank you for your great question. Uh, I look forward to your own dissertation, where I'm sure you'll be able to answer this important question as well. Um, we think of photographic solidarities. Um, at this, based on the archives that I have seen, I wasn't looking for that um, specifically, um, but nothing comes immediately to mind. I think that it was the indirect uh, material about kind of um, the insertion of Vietnam. Like, so there are narratives of um, tensions as well. There are like fraught solidarities and then tensions. So on the one hand, kind of the, this, this notion of communist revolution is not like uniform, right? Um, so the tension that's most obvious is between the Khmer Rouge and the Vietnamese. So shortly afterwards, uh, there was a Vietnam uh, Cambodian war. And what I was telling you a little bit about, which is like uh, something that I was told um, was not such a well, is well known in Vietnam, but not so well documented. Um, and it's a 
the insertion of Vietnamese photographers and uh, as uh, Cambodian photographers and a desire to kind of project the vision of Vietnamese um, um, liberation onto kind of this narrative of Cambodia. Um, so that's the, in my mind, like the kind of solidarity that you were thinking of, but that's, that's the opposite of it <laughs> um, actually. But I think that it's important in thinking through solidarity to know kind of the, the heterogeneous visions of what revolution and uh, possibility um, might be. And also to um, take seriously the violence that's committed in the name of revolution as well. Um, so uh, that photographic solidarity is also another um, yet to be fully explored area of study when it comes to um, Southeast Asian photography. So Dr. Fu, in the Vietnam War, US photographers had a well-established infrastructure of supply and processing of their film. What kind of support infrastructure existed for North Vietnamese forces? That's also a great question. Thank you, Matt, um, for sharing that. Um, it's true that there was like a very um, uneven um, infrastructures for the circulation of uh, war imagery. Um, the Vietnamese relied upon, uh, as I noted in the presentation, um, supplies from China and Soviet Union and East Germany. Um, and they were seeking to move their images out through those routes. Uh, they also sought to move their images out through kind of the um, uh, the anti-war tourists that visited Hanoi um, during those times. But um, even as they thought that they were going to document the news of the war, and they, they did try to use wire equipment to um, disseminate their vision of the war throughout, like to as many um, foreign um, presses as possible, they knew that it was very unlikely that they would get it out in enough time for it to be constituted as news, um, the overtly propagandistic um, publications such as Vietnam Pictorial were published through friendship societies in um, different languages, including Spanish, Laotian, French, and so on. And they went out um, through those particular routes. Um, it's not yet, uh, clear how they got out, but most likely by way of China and Hong Kong. Um, so in addition to Chris noting that um, his memories of the Vietnam War were heavily influenced by photography, uh, Tad mentions that even today the Vietnamese government does not allow for images and stories, interviews of Southern soldiers and families in Vietnam. The archives in Hanoi only have one side of the American war. As do the archives in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, yeah, I, and I think that in part, this, in large part, this is what prompted my, um, my project to begin with, was um, just chafing at Kind of the perspective, like the dominant perspective that we get from North American and indeed many parts of Europe um, that kind of has a meta narrative about the war and just knowing um, that there were many other kinds of images, like the personal images to begin with, the vernacular images, and then just the curiosity about what this other unofficial history might, um, what this other official history might offer and to understand that there was just, as my book documents, um, a warring vision of the nation and of Vietnam.
So I'm, I'm curious about the nature of the archival research. So, um, you know, is there is there a strong kind of hold on archival research for a lot of these topics? Do you have to have permission from governing bodies for this or, um, you know, is it open access? How, how exactly does this work for you? You need a letter of introduction. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You need to be vetted. The letter of introduction needs to be on letterhead, and there needs to be a Vietnamese version. It helps to have a fixer, somebody who can guide your way. Um, there are Vietnamese studies researchers who um, kind of write about their challenges in accessing the archives in Hanoi and, and in Ho Chi Minh City. So yes, it is, you know, it is challenging to be able to access the archives. Less challenging now than in the 90s, mm. but you know, different challenges. This is like the we're in still in the middle of a pandemic, right? Um, so would the stories and images of the Northern Vietnamese photographers in the book Requiem be helpful in any way? Yeah. Um, I'm there, there's like a permanent exhibit as part of the Requiem project in Ho Chi Minh City in the War Remnants Museum. And Christina Schwenkel writes really beautifully about kind of the politics of memory in the midst of this collaboration. It's just one of, of many uh, or a, a growing number of um, work that's been really thoughtfully um, considering kind of both the moments in which there's a kind of a shared um, effort at memorializing the war. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about the Requiem project. Uh, my discomfort with the, the project in, in, in some ways is about kind of this um, narrative of me another meta narrative of photojournalism as kind of a heroic, um, uh, highly masculinist enterprise. Um, and I think that the Requiem project um, sometimes um, years into that, but it is a very interesting and important project. Thank you for um, centering it, Ted. Are there any more questions? Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, Teeth, I mean, T's uh, speech opens up all the questions we're gonna address <laughs> throughout the rest of today. Like include, even including like uh, like photographic solidarity, the question about it. Like it's, I, I'm gonna address that in my paper from the part perspective of anti-communist law. Because the Vietnam War and its images play a very important role in South, South Korean uh, photographic <laughs> circles as well during the 60s and 70s. So, and also the question itself, like Southeast Asia, like what well, the title of the, this symposium is not Southeast Asia photography, but I intentionally chose photography and Southeast Asia, like kind of creating tension between like the history of photography versus like the, the imaginary of the, the region called Southeast Asia. But the term itself was widely uh, circulated and populated uh, specifically during the, the Cold War era in the 50s and 60s uh, in, in Asia, like in, in South Korea particularly. So yeah, I really, uh, I'm really happy to uh, raise the question in your speech, and I'm pretty sure uh, other 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 speakers will address the same issue uh, throughout the day as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you everyone for your wonderful. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Fu. I think with that, we'll take about a 15 minute break, uh, just a short break, and then we'll reconvene at uh, 11:30 Mountain Time. Um, and then begin with our next special session. Thank you so much again. And uh, I also want to thank um, my uh, fellow colleagues and panelists um, for uh, having this opportunity to uh, share ideas and uh, for me to listen to your, uh, your talks. And also thank you to the audience uh, for um, for taking the time to uh, to listen to me and to see my work. 
So um, the main focus of my talk uh, will be work that I've done in Seyap, which is a region uh, west of Hong Kong and uh, Macau. I did this work in 2018, um, and this was after having worked on several series of photographs that had an international focus, um, which I started uh, around 2001. I initially thought that these um, series of works that I had done uh, prior to the Say Up work um, had influenced the direction that I took uh, with this, this work in Say Up. Um, but after researching this area, its peoples and its history, which also um, is the history of my uh, paternal ancestry, um, I began wondering somewhat paradoxically whether it was might have been the other way around. Maybe it was uh, the his, the, this work in Seyap and the historical circumstances that um, led up to the environments that I'm depicting that uh, influenced and informed the work that I had done previously. Um, in a way, doing the Seyap work allowed me to retrospect, retrospect, uh, sorry, retrospectively discover how ancestral experiences originating in Southeast Asia uh, might have subconsciously permeated my work. So um, broadly speaking, my work is an effort to picture the world and to show it in ways that help us get a sense of spatial and historical scales that envelop us, not only as individuals, but also as societies. And um, there are several uh, recurring concerns and questions that have driven my work. So the first is a uh, focus on borders, um, not only looking at how arbitrary they can be as the way to divide up the world, um, its landscapes and its peoples, but also looking at how they can be traversed and to and how they can um, uh, traversing them can reveal hidden relationships. So I mean, mean this both in a physical sense, um, say in the sense of transnational crossings, but also conceptually as in questioning and collapsing the distinctions between uh, foreign and familiar or near and far. So this gets to a second important interest, which has to do with picturing distance. Uh, it's not only as a visual and a physical quality, um, one that's important in picturing landscape, but also how it can be absorbed into one's identity and worldview and how this worldview can be expressed. So, um, an important question for me is how can we look closely at distance and how can we hold the far close? Um, lastly, um, another important focus in my work is on erasure. Um, and this has to do with looking at how it reshapes not only the environments that surround us, but also history and identity. It's an interest in the political and social uses of erasure and how they affect landscapes and societies. But there's also an interest in the opposite of uncovering what has been hidden under layers of erasure. So um, before showing you my uh, say up work, I thought I would start with briefly showing you some of my previous work where I explore these issues. Um, issues that, as I mentioned before, I initially thought led up to the say up work, but that now I see as perhaps influenced by ancestral experiences in Southeast Asia. Um, and these experiences that persisted through generations and family experiences, and that have created a particular relationship to the world. So let me um, share my screen. Hopefully this will work all right. Okay, so is, is that working? Yes. Uh, can you see? Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, so the, the first series I'd like to show is called Horizons um, that I've been working on since uh, 2001 as a continuing series. Um, it's a global series of landscapes uh, throughout the world where I've explored uh, the issues of borders, borders and uh, distance. Um, so the pictures are compositionally linked by the horizon, um, creating a sense of continuity. Um, and uh, so that, for example, um, you can have a salt lake in Bolivia, which merges into a lava field in Iceland, which joins a, joins a plain in Kenya, and then a tile uh, flat in, in France is, is what's pictured in some of these images. Um, the installation of the images creates proximities across distances and shows links that wouldn't otherwise be, be visible. 
so in this case, for example, you have Venice next to uh, California, next to Agra uh, in India, uh, next to London, next to Mexico City. So I wanted the experience of viewing these images to be of uh, trying to place oneself um, and hopefully to encourage viewers to question the assumptions and distinctions uh, that we hold about what we consider familiar and foreign or near and far. So for example, um, in looking at this picture, uh, many assume it's the Seine because of the Eiffel Tower, um, but everything around it starts looking unfamiliar and strange. So the um, image is actually of uh, Samsung, uh, which in Mandarin is known as uh, Shenzhen, uh, which is not so far from, from Seiya. Um, or this image, which when I was working on it on the darkroom, in, in the darkroom, um, a fellow photographer came up and said it was a wonderful picture of Jersey City. Well, in fact, um, this is Gehyeong, which in Mandarin is known as Gaoxiong. Um, in, in Taiwan. This is kind of like a collapsing of um, what we uh, seem to know over great distances. Um, so uh, part of this might be um, in, in my work to be able to join uh, and, and link physically places that have been close, uh, say through migration. So we have Hong Kong next to San Francisco, uh, next to Liverpool. And um, while this series is about questioning and dissolving borders, uh, part of it is also an effort to point them out, uh, to show the, uh, say, the social impulse to construct walls, uh, separating humans from nature um, as a means of defense, as in this picture of saint -Malo, um, or controlling nature and circumscri circumscribing it within the parameters of human needs. Um, such as this picture of the uh, Three Gorges Dam in China, or setting arbitrary borders and boundaries to separate humans uh, from each other, as in this uh, picture of the West Bank, or um, controlling populations and their natural tendency to move. Um, this is in Tijuana. So th the horizon um, for me serves as a reminder um, of openness and possibility. This is sort of what this, uh, grounds this, uh, this, this project. Um, and it's a reminder of a very basic relationship with the planet. Um, I chose the title Horizons, not only because it describes the physical line that I'm picturing, but also because it symbolizes the farthest that we can see. Um, this picture, by the way, is of the Philippine Sea from, from Taiwan. The sense of distance um, also implies the possibility of going towards the horizon and the promise of seeing uh, what's, what's beyond. Uh, this image of Suruga Bay in Japan and, uh, and of the Indian Ocean. So in um, 2016, I made a very different picture of the world from the one I made in Horizons um, in the form of a series called Atlas. Um, it was made in response to very, for, to very different circumstances. Uh, this was shortly um, after the Brexit referendum and the 2016 American election. And uh, there are consequences of the further closing of borders, the breakup of a sense of responsibility to and belonging to the larger world uh, that transcends borders, and the rise or really a recurrence of uglier, uglier forms of nationalism disturbingly uh, tied to race. So um, this series um, is uh, the representations of all the countries in the world. So um, here uh, you see what looks like a landscape um, with uh, a title underneath, uh, which in this case is the, the, the Philippines. So they're meant to look like um, aerial landscapes seen from, from afar, but in fact, uh, these are close-up pictures of, of the grounds. Um, and these are actually the pavements in front of the world's embassies and consulates in London. Um, and London was particularly important, not only because it was uh, Brexit had just happened, but also because it was a former center of empire and colonialism. Uh, that transforms not only the world, but also how much of the world sees the world itself. 
Um, this um, region uh, uh, also contributed in the 18th and 19th centuries to a form of topographic representation of the world's landscapes uh, through engraved portfolios of distant places. And it's this kind of tradition that I'm referencing in this, these, these images. So in a way, this form of representation was used as a tool of empire, um, but the center of which has now, after Brexit, become a place that's more inward looking and fo focused on a much smaller scale. So these images are both about uh, looking close and looking far at the same time and creating this uh, paradox um, of distance. And what struck me uh, um, after taking these photographs is that sometimes there was an uncanny resemblance to the actual landscapes of these countries. So for instance, this, um, this close-up uh, image of, um, in front of the embassy of Kuwait it reminded me of those pictures of the burning oil fields um, in, in the deserts, um, or uh, the verdant cover and the riverine uh, networks in Vietnam, or the salt flats in Bolivia, or the coastal topographies of Thailand. Or even uh, the rainforests that uh, used to cover Hong Kong. So between um, 2001 and 2005, uh, I worked on a series called His uh, History Images, which looked at the relationship between erasure, uh, environments, and political power. So in a way, it was an effort to picture the workings of power on a very large scale, um, that of cities. That's a parallel to how power works on uh, all levels of society and culture. I focused on China, um, during a period of dramatic change uh, to the built environment as the country passed between periods of history. Um, it was uh, enabled by the vast uh, generation of wealth um, uh, saved by the world's need for manufacturing, uh, kind of a historical need um, that's enabled this transformation of, of cities and society that um, the government had previously on, only thought of theoretically. Um, so one of the clearest examples is um, the uh, Cultural Revolution slogan from the 1960s, which was smash the old world and build the new world. Um, so it, this was the um, sort of the culmination of this uh, theoretical desire um, on a, a countrywide scale. So while um, destruction on this scale um, happens mostly during warfare or natural disasters, this was very much a deliberate one um, inflicted within the country's own borders. So I photographed the demolition of historical sites, uh, mostly on an urban scale in many areas of, of the country. And um, what really struck me was the, uh, the diversity of environments um, and the, the, the differences. And it, 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 it reminded me that um, despite the efforts to portray the country as a homogenous culture, in reality, it's a vast region of dramatic cultural and lingu linguistic differences. Um, so much so that seeing this diff these differences is a reminder of how much power and control is needed to hold the country together as a single entity. So um, one uh, very clear example is, for, for example, with languages. Um, it's a place where, for example, example um, languages are as different as Sicilian is to French, or Ukrainian to Flemish, or Quechua to Nahuatl. But because of a system of um, unrestrained political power, um, these languages are called uh, dialects as a re reinforcement of the power and um, domination over others, uh, carried sub subconsciously uh, through vocabulary. So to take this example and put it into the, um, into the uh, urban um, example of what I was photographing, the uh, words that I kept on um, hearing that had entered into uh, people's vocabulary was that these neighborhoods were dangerous and dilapidated. And I kept on hearing this over and over again. And, and also um, realizing that this was the kind of rhetoric that was used to uh, describe the neighborhood, these, these traditional neighborhoods, but also as a, uh, as a rationale for destroying them, 
um, it was uh, a way of um, seeping into uh, a, um, a view of history um, into, into the public. Um, this erasure uh, really um, spread down through the layers of history. So in this image, um, you can see that's uh, sort of very clearly um, illustrated through this kind of um, a stratification of history that's, that's being destroyed. So the bottom, uh, you see the traditional uh, buildings uh, being destroyed. Above that, this is the socialist um, period of history, uh, which, um, and on top of that, the, uh, the sort of new uh, capitalism. So uh, these vast differences um, of, uh, of buildings that represent different cultures, um, what I saw all in the process of being erased. Uh, so from the courtyard houses of Beijing um, to the row houses of Shanghai, and then to the hybrid houses of uh, Fujian. So this erasure of history uh, through the erasure of distinct regional styles is parallel with the country's erasure of distinct identities, cultures and languages, and the erasure of difference and dissension. It's part of an effort towards constructing a unified, singular and homogenous culture with a dominant ideology and race and a clear hierarchy of power and subservience. And this history of erasure is as old as Chinese civilization. So today we see uh, one of the most developed systems of erasure through technology um, against expression and ideas. Uh, we also see it in the erasure an elimination, say, of student movements and students themselves. We see it in how people would be purged from photographs and from history if they fell, fell out of favor. And we also see it in the way that each dynasty would destroy cities and rewrite history. And we see it in the way that indigenous cultures were conquered, their lands colonized and settled, and their cultures erased. So now I'd like to turn to the uh, Cantonese uh, region of Seiya, um, starting with uh, a series from 2018 called uh, Lookout Towers. Um, some, some of the basic facts about these, um, these buildings in the region, uh, these are uh, defensive watchtowers called Yulao, um, built uh, starting in the 16th century, but really reaching a height uh, in the late 19th and early, early 20th centuries. And they were built by people who had left um, and from a distance had sent money back through remittances uh, to build these, these buildings. Um, so this work is, um, it's, it's actually really a personal exploration in the sense that uh, working in it has also been a way to discover uh, my family's history as this is the ancestral region of my, uh, of my paternal grandfather. Um, it's a process of discovery that is uh, not only one of uncovering family histories, but seeing how the layers of history in this region have been erased over time as a re result of imperial and political power to the extent that they have been largely um, unknown, uh, even to the culture that they are part of. And what this work and its associated research reveals for me um, is a particular and complex relationship with the foreign and with distance. Um, also an ingrained effort to traverse borders uh, based in historical experience and an identity built upon layer, uh, layers of erasures. So I um, first found out about these, uh, these towers when I was finishing work um, on history images uh, around 2004. Um, and um, I had known that my father uh, was born in Toisan, uh, which is, um, one of the regions of Seiya. Um, but my family actually knew very little about his life uh, or his life before he left to Liverpool um, in 1911 uh, when he was 20 years old. And it was only until um, much, much later, this was around 2016, when my father uh, started looking into his father's history, that I discovered that my uh, grandfather had actually contributed to this, 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 this history. 
and that his village um, had uh, some of these buildings. He had sent money to, to build several buildings in this style. And so in encountering these buildings, um, even though they seemed mysterious and unknown to me, there was something uh, familiar about them. Um, the experience of first encountering them was actually similar to the experience that I wanted to ev evoke in my Horizon series of not being able to easily place oneself and of being known yet strange at the same time. Um, more importantly, they invoked something of a personal and social history that is embedded in the building's form. The uh, international range of details and influences in the building's design spoke of being connected and part of the larger world. They seemed rooted yet apart from their context um, at the same time. And they seemed like they had been there for generations, uh, yet they did not belong to the country that surrounds them. The buildings and the, the history that, that created them just raised so many questions uh, uh, for me. So there were questions uh, specific to the buildings, such as why do they look like fortresses? Um, why are they an amalgam of styles from around the world? And there were also questions about the people who built them, who built them, and what these buildings say about them. Why did the Cantonese become one of the largest diasporas in the world? Um, why did they feel so at ease with with traveling uh, and uh, such far distances? Uh, why were they able to become part of so many societies around the world and absorb so many influences? And why did they feel so comfortable with the foreign and with, uh, with traversing borders? So um, in order to tackle some of these questions, both about the buildings and about the people, I had to dig uh, further and further back in history through layers upon layers of erasures. And it led me to the, um, to the indigenous peoples who inhabited this land before being conquered and colonized by the Han. Um, but Despite the efforts to eliminate these indigenous cultures, uh, their influence, I believe, has endured in profound ways. So um, this region, um, and it's um, actually a rather large region, um, which goes from what's today known as Mandarin as Zhejiang through Fujian, uh, Guangdong, and to Northern Vietnam, was um, inhabited by peoples from prehistory um, um, up until probably the first uh, millennium uh, CE by uh, people known as the Yut in Cantonese. Um, in Mandarin, they're known as the Yue, and in Vietnamese as the Viet. Um, these were actually hundreds of cultures um, that had been part of the, these lands for millennia. Another name uh, to describe these cultures is the Ba Yu, uh, or the Ba Yue, uh, which is hun a hundred Yu. Uh, a hundred just means that there's, there's a, mo uh, a multiplicity of, of these cultures. Um, but what's interesting and tragic about the name Yu is that this is not the name that they call themselves. We actually don't know what these cultures call themselves. Their, their original names and cultures have been erased um, over history and over a long series of conquests and colonizations from the North, um, starting from when the area was conquered by the Han in uh, 111 uh, uh, BCE. Um, so uh, scholars have um, looked into what the, um, the the meaning of the name Yut uh, meant originally. And um, this name, which is given by the Han to describe these, these cultures, um, probably meant something like beyond or over, um, foreign or outside. It was a way to say that these peoples are the foreign other, uh, the people over there. And this name of Yut or Yue um, endures as a name to call the Cantonese. The Cantonese are also called the, the Yue today. 
So what tied the Ute societies together was that they were, um, as historian Erica Brindley described them, uh, riverine and maritime cultures. And uh, by the way, uh, Erica Brindley has written an amazing book um, outlining this, this history and also the challenge of writing about cultures uh, who were only described by their conquerors. Um, the, these were water-based cultures that moved and explored over waterways, um, rivers, and seas, and who were constantly traversing distances um, and also constantly in contact with different societies. Um, so consistent with this maritime culture, uh, their borders uh, were, were fluid. Um, these cultures uh, were tied together by the landscape that they lived in and created a coherence of social practices that bound together the region of uh, Southeast Asia. Um, it was a culture that was completely distinct from the plains-based cultures of Northern China. So um, what is now Seyap was for most of its history more closely and culturally related to the region that we now consider Southeast Asia and to the northern land-based cultures of Asia. Um, we can see this actually very interestingly in the name of, the, of Yut, that also is the same as Viet, and that Seyap was home to uh, the peoples called the, the southern Yut. Uh, in Cantonese, this is uh, Nam, Nam Yut, which in Vietnamese is Nam Viet the reversal of Vietnam. Um, so because of the rich resources of these lands, um, they were continuously conquered and colonized by cultures from the North that had developed uh, military cultures. So starting with the Han. Um, once the Yut lands were settled, their cultures would be gradually erased as so-called civilized Chinese culture was introduced to overpower and gradually subdue and eliminate so-called barbarian indigenous uh, practices. Um, the dis this distinction between the civilized middle and the barbarian periphery um, and exterior would, would endure. Um, it's a sadly familiar process that has affected indigenous societies throughout the world. And one that we see recurring in today's policies of harm, domination and repression over its colonized cultures um, to the Northwest and also to the Southwest. Um, so this attitude is apparent in the name that was given to Seiya um, by the Han around the third century. So this name um, in Mandarin is Pingyi, um, which means suppressed barbarians. And it was, um, this name was given because of the concentration of indigenous peoples um, in this area. So while the Yut already had an uh, ingrained relationship with the foreign through maritime exchange, another relationship to the foreign was created through Han colonization and forced assimilation. It's a relationship that's built into um, the, that's even built into the genetic lineages of Cantonese people, um, where um, the paternal lineages are predominantly Han, while the maternal lineages are predominantly indigenous. Um, and which also sadly is another gendered historical pattern of male driven conquest and domination over indigenous societies. So this erasure of the Yut is further evidence in the Chinese tradition of not giving uh, women names. So when I went to my grandfather's village, um, I was, very lucky to see my grandfather's genealogy, which uh, stretched over uh, 17 generations. I was, it, I was very lucky to see it and that it existed because most of these genealogies were burned during the Cultural Revolution, um, another kind of effort at erasing history. Um, in this genealogy, uh, women were not acknowledged until 11 generations in, and even then did, they did not receive any names. They were only identified by the village they were from. So finding about, out about this history of conquest and domination made it clearer to me what I explored in history images. 
that uh, Chinese culture has a long and established history of erasure. It's reminded me how fraught and problematic the history has been that has created these categories that we use to divide people. For example, this category of what is Chinese. It reminded me of how this distinction is grounded in a history based upon the exercise of power over those who are different and outside of the center, the erasure of their identities, the establishment of a dominant culture and narrative, and the creation of a profusion of lost histories. So I started asking myself what remains of the Yut um, in Cantonese culture. Um, Cantonese culture emerged out of the attempted erasure of indigenous cultures and the imposition of a foreign uh, colonial culture. And so through this research, I began to see the aspects of the Ute cultures were nevertheless so ingrained that they did persist. Um, I have mentioned the persistence of uh, maternal lines and how this genetic research has linked uh, Cantonese to an indigenous history. There's also um, language about how, how scholars have theorized that um, Ute languages have made their way into Cantonese and Toisanese. And I'd like to suggest that there are several important characteristics of Ute culture that uh, formed important parts of Cantonese culture. Um, one is the relationship with, with distance. Um, this is coming out of a history of indigenous exchange with faraway cultures through this um, uh, maritime and, um, uh, and riverine uh, way of life that created a familiarity with foreignness. Um, this was because of these, um, these, this, this water-based life, but also because of uh, its experiences with colonization and with foreign settlements. Another aspect of the, this relationship to, to distance is that the history of colonization from the North created a deeply embedded suspicion of rule from afar. And this is expressed in the Cantonese saying, the mountains are high and the emperor is far away. Um, the, the, the law actually became um, associated with uh, injustice and ways were found uh, to, to, to bend the rules. Um, we can see this, this history of distrust of, um, of foreign rule by the history of rebellions against Han rule. Uh, but also by the fact that um, more, uh, recent, uh, in more recent history, um, the Qing court uh, prohibited contact with foreigners and that emigration was punishable by, by death. Um, but because um, the Seyat region was so far from the center of power, these rules were, were subverted. Um, this uh, relationship is uh, with foreignness also endures in popular uh, historical stereotypes um, held by uh, the Chinese about the Cantonese, um, and primarily that they're polluted by foreignness, um, that they're uh, uncultured and even threatening in, in their their alienness. Um, and it's, it's it's for me this this is a persistence of this um, conceptualization of the Yut as the foreign other and of the Ute as um, uncivilized barbarians. Um, and it's, it's this othering and the need to tame it is also present in the naming of Cantonese as a dialect rather than it's a language in its own right. And also tragically, um, it's uh, been played out in, um, uh, in, in recent history uh, in Hong Kong. So an, another very important characteristic of uh, Cantonese culture that came out of this Ute history um, and its colonized uh, histories is that uh, movement and displacement are inherent parts of this culture. Um, this is the reason, um, or these are the reasons why it was so natural for the Cantonese to leave, uh, to leave this region, and why such a large diaspora was created, um, and also why the Cantonese were ready to absorb so many influences uh, from around the world, uh, which uh, are um, embedded in these, these buildings. Um, so 
starting in the 14th and 15th centuries and then reaching a peak in the 19th and early 20th, 20th centuries, there was a mass exodus of people, uh, numbering in the millions, um, who, learned, who left for all corners of the world. Uh, Torreon, Caracas, Havana, Johannesburg, Hamburg, Liverpool, uh, Calcutta, and the, the list goes on. And in the United States, um, before 1965, um, the Cantonese actually made up um, between 90 and 95% of the so-called uh, Chinese population in the, in the US. Um, and this is very much the historical background to why my family has experienced so many migrations over the generations and why I have three nationalities. Um, so my family um, is, is spread all over the world, Britain, uh, Mexico, the States, Australia, Saudi Arabia, um, Papua New Guinea. Um, and uh, so for the, for the generations who left in the 19th and early 20th centuries, the immediate reasons to leave um, were uh, strife and political instability and a lack of opportunity and hope. Um, the native lands had become inherently unsafe and even untenable. Um, but there were also the deeply rooted reasons I mentioned um, of a long relationship with distance and foreignness of mobility and displacement and I think of a deeply embedded and subconscious feeling of loss of lands, of culture, and of home. So finding out, out about this region's history um, gave me some clarity about the towers. Um, I was told they were built to defend against bandits um, so that people could barricade themselves inside and also so that they could um, look out uh, for them from above to have this view of the distance. Um, historically, I began to see how the lower part um, is uh, a defensive part that perhaps could have been influenced by Han watchtowers and Tang uh, walled fortifications because the uh, region was colonized and a state of warfare and control had been imposed. And with that, the introduction of martial architectures um, in order to enforce uh, conquest. So it represents the local and daily reality of being under siege. Um, the upper part, on the other hand, um, is really represents this kind of look, look to the distance and look beyond um, the, the horizon. Um, it's um, it represents influences from around the world. Um, you can see Roman arches, you can see Greek pediments, uh, medieval turrets, um, Gothic arches, um, and also the influence of the local uh, Lingnan architecture of balconies. Um, uh, this building um, was, was kind of called the Spanish building. Um, maybe because of its vaguely Moorish uh, details. And um, ultimately these towers for me represent this um, looking out to the distance and uh, of bringing the far away close. So the towers, they defy uh, conventions of what regional style should look like and are very much their own. Um, I started seeing this, these towers as the mirror of the identity of the people. Um, whose defining characteristic is being spread all over the world. And I also started seeing them as a, as a built form of ancestry. So in fact, I composed these photographs to reflect uh, two, tradi two traditions. Uh, one is ancestor portraits found throughout Asia um, that are frontally and symmetrically composed. And the other are um, Beaux-Arts architectural renderings uh, that are drawn in elevation, but also represent this collage of historical styles that were a major influence on the design of these towers. Um, Beaux-Arts at the, the time represented modernity and internationalism, but of course at the time that was the height of European colonialism. The Cantonese expressed their wish to engage this world through immigrations and the adoption of these styles, but how this engagement was reciprocated is another troubled and tragic history. 
So um, starting in the US and spreading to Canada, Mexico, Australia, South America, um, the Cantonese experienced another form of brutal erasure. Um, the US in particular, they were met, met in the 19th and 20th century with resistance ranging from, ranging from populist brutality in the form of expulsions and massacres to state legislation in the form of race-based exclusionary laws. Um, Asians have been barred in one form or another from the US from 1875 until 1965. Um, and in Australia, it was until 1973. So um, over 200 Cantonese communities across the American West were driven out and erased. Um, and uh, what happened was that exclusion uh, first in the US and, and then in these other countries drove the construction of these towers um, because uh, family members uh, would be left in Sayup and needed protection. Um, this was because um, the, the separation of families was because of the restrictions of the immigration of women, um, which was a strategy to prevent the settlement and growth of families. Um, so this uh, looking out that the towers represent um, is also an architectural parallel to separated families looking out to the distance. They represent the effort to create a new home elsewhere while reflecting the realities of the stage of siege and danger and life in a place that was no longer viable as a home. So I couldn't help but see a parallel, um, both formal and cultural between the Seiyup Towers and today's Hong Kong. They seem to bring current events into historical context and the tragic sense that this city of towers is no longer safe for its inhabitants. That the cycle of coloniza colonization has recurred, the native lands are again no longer viable and that the new diaspora is again being created with more than, 100,000 are now leaving the city every year. So I also photographed um, the remnants of this uh, previous diaspora in the form of uh, mostly abandoned homes uh, in Seya. Um, these buildings are the residential equivalents of the Lookout Towers um, in their combination of styles and in their uh, absorption of the far away. Um, today, they're mostly empty, they're inhabitants long gone and their descendant, descendants uh, spread throughout the world. And despite their use as homes, um, I was really struck by, struck by the fact that they still have this fortress-like feel about them, much like the towers. And uh, this is a building in uh, an abandoned village that was actually called Canada Village um, because that's where all of the inhabitants had emigrated to. And as you can see is in the, uh, the maple leaf on this building. So other um, uh, type of building that I photographed was um, uh, ancestor halls, uh, which is another more direct expression of buildings as a form of ancestry that carry in them uh, the experiences of generations. Uh, so some of them were indeed abandoned, some still well-maintained. And others more uh, informal. But one thing that uh, really struck me was this picture that was this was the use of um, pictures of ancestors. Um, it's this frontality um, that I mentioned before. And these are depictions that began in painting and then moved to photography. Um, so this form was the one that I mentioned had an influence on the composition of, of Lookout Towers. And it's also related to the last uh, body of work I'd like to show you, which is a series of, of paintings. This, by the way, is actually my, uh, uh, my family's ancestral building, um, which still have pictures of the branches of different branches of the family and altars, but which was rented out, um, which is why you see uh, people's belongings uh, in there. 
Um, so I, I started looking at uh, what was going on at the same time as this great wave of, uh, of emigration um, in the distance across the ocean uh, in the United States. Um, it was partly an effort to find out about the people who built these towers, um, partly an effort to find out about the history of the place where I live, uh, California, and partly an effort to find out about the origins of anti-Asian hate in this country. Um, and uh, I should mention that I'm really grateful to several historians, um, Erica Lee, Anna Pegla Gordon, uh, and Beth Lee Williams in particular, whose books have shed an incredible amount of light on this period. So what I began focusing on in particular is how the growth of Cantonese emigration during the 1850s um, and onwards, um, the rise of anti-Asian violence and legislation in the United States, and the creation of border enforcement in the United States all coincided with the beginnings and growth of the history of photography. So beyond its um, aesthetic value of uh, photography at the time, its emergence, um, as we well know, was seen by the state as a useful tool for the policing of people and the cataloging of, cataloging of criminals. And its use was adopted in the United States through exclusion le legislations aimed at what the American government classified as Chinese, uh, most famously through the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. So this category of Chinese became the only racial group to be required to have photographs on file um, at the time, and the first to be required to carry ID cards in the States as a sort of an internal passport system to enforce uh, deportation. So this creation of a bureaucracy designed to enforce borders, to limit, exclude, and erase, also created a vast archive of photographic portraits of people in the process of attempting to become American. And it's this trove of portraits that has become the basis uh, for the series of paintings. Um, I spent time in the National Archives looking through these, um, these ID cards, these certificates of, of residency, and which was an incredibly poignant experience just to see the hundreds or thousands of, of, of photographs of people all collected together um, in these archival boxes. So the other piece of photographic history that I'm looking at is, um, is landscape photography, uh, which is commonly seen as inseparable from the history of the American West. Um, in many of the, the, these um, paintings I've included uh, landscape backgrounds, uh, which are drawn from the historical landscape photographs of the time and of the places that these people depicting in, in, the photo, in, in these paintings uh, were try, trying to settle in. Um, there's a particular aspect, aspect of these landscape photographs that I was uh, interested in, um, which was um, their function of surveying and claiming uh, ownership over lands that were stolen and where vast efforts were made to restrict access to them uh, from prohibiting ownership of lands to physically expelling people from them. So on a national scale, this ethos of expelling people from lands is seen in the creation of the deportation system. Um, it's important to know that the deportation system that we now, now associate as being aimed primarily towards um, to, uh, Latin America was actually originally designed against um, Asians. Um, and which these photographs, these, the photographs that these paintings are based on uh, represents. So the um, inclusion of landscapes in portraits in Western painting has traditionally been a way to create a sense of ownership and belonging. So we think of early Netherlandish paintings such as uh, Memling. Um, it's used to create a sense of depth through the depiction of distance, but in these case, these, th these characteristics that the depiction of landscape is supposed to connote of a sense of belonging and of a sense of distance are deeply fraught and contested. 
So um, I see these paintings as a way of addressing and questioning these, these traditions. Um, on uh, on the one level, I see this as an effort to move these paint these um, these portraits away from the rep repressive and towards the honorific uh, by changing the medium and therefore changing the way these portraits are seen and and, and read. This for this um, portrait, for example, of um, Li Ayo uh, has the background of Honolulu, and the previous of. Um, of Jue Hoi uh, of the Sierra Madre. Um, so I'm really interested in this historical oscillation in portraiture from painting uh, to photography, and in this case, back again. This uh, of Wong Kun Jim um, in Boston, uh, 1919. Um, so that the color is a nod to the range of mono, is a nod to the range of monochromes in black and white photography. And also the recognition that it's not just black and white. Um, it's also from being struck by finding out that one of the reasons why photography was implemented um, was this uh, racist belief that all Asians looked alike. And therefore, photography was used as an aid to separate and, and identify them. Here's a detail. And um, and also very importantly, I'm very attracted to the physicality of, of painting and also intrigued by how the vocabulary used at the time against different peoples is also used to describe physical and visual processes in painting. Words such as scraping, excluding, wiping, purging, and erasing. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nicholas. I mean, it's really, really fascinating talk. And I had the privilege to learn, uh, I mean, read your um, piece on Say Yap <laughs> to, uh, during, uh, during the summer. And uh, well, I have so many questions and I also invite uh, the audience uh, to post their, their question on the Q&A box as well. So, like, uh, you start, uh, started uh, your talk with uh, the idea of erasure, but at the same time, I do see, I mean, throughout the photographs you, you show uh, this talk, at this talk, like, it's very tenaciously um, uh, persisting and never erased traces of uh, multiple identities, and also, uh, which is quite, uh, well intertwined with the these diasporic uh, communities attempts to restructure their identity but at the same time failing and failing and failing again so i wonder um you could uh elaborate uh, further on the idea of like uh this like multiple layers or like like the never erased uh traces of of your family history or even your identity or even Cantonese diaspora as well. Yeah. yeah. Because I intentionally invited you uh, to this symposium, like because as a mode to blur the boundary of the, the territorial imaginary of uh, Southeast Asia. So yeah. Um, I, um, that's, I, I really appreciate your insights about um, this kind of persistence, despite efforts, efforts to, to erase, that traces always, um, always remain. Um, I uh, uh, grew up in Mexico City, which was also a place that um, was uh, permeated by this, uh, this, these layers that um, were attempted to be erased, but, th but that still remain. Um, I mean, obviously, you can actually see it in the center of Mexico City, where uh, the cathedral has been built on top of the Templo Mayor, um, and you can also you see those those traces underneath, um, or how the uh, this uh, network of canals still remains, and it remains in a very interesting way because um, you see this this city that was built on a lake that has been affected by by earthquakes, and then. Because the earthquakes happen um, on a kind of a wave form, the build you see the build the facades kind of waving back and forth because of the earthquakes, and so these these kind of emergence of 
of histories that um, uh, that I that really impacted me as growing up as a child. And uh, so these um, this kind of outlook carried on to all aspects of of my um, uh, life and also approaching uh, photographing um, in in Asia. Um, I was really struck uh, when starting um, uh, the uh, History Images um, series, um, just about the, the scale of, of uh, destruction that I had been sort of aware of um, in, in Mexico, the, the destruction of previous um, um, buildings and cities, and um, that I really wanted to, to, to get in. And um, I think for me, it was also a, a process of discovery of my uh, family history um, that uh, actually for most of my family had not been um, aware of. There was not very much that could be said beyond say when my, my grandfather had arrived um, in, in, uh, in the UK. And um, I actually had uh, the more research that I, I, I did, the more I discovered that there, that there was more to be dug up, uh, that, uh, that, that most people were completely um, unaware of. Um, it's, it, and it's actually something that is continuing because um, on my um, mother's side, uh, her ancestry is Malaysian Hokkien, which is also um, historically seen as a youth culture that has this kind of maritime um, uh, a basis to their to their culture, but which I know hardly anything about, and which I will continue to uh, to uncover. I hope. Thank you. Like uh, we, well, I mean, I'm pretty sure I mean, this is really fantastic talk for me, for the audience. And uh, well, one question from uh, Kenny Wong. So wonderful talk. And I'd love to find out where to read more on your uh, Say Yup project, like publication forthcoming or even article. Well, we could say. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I did, uh, I've written an, an essay about the Say Up work, which will be published uh, by the Art Institute of Chicago um, and their online uh, uh, journal, the Art Institute Review, um, early next year. And uh, so that that will be the the opportunity to um, to to read. Um, I of course hope um, eventually to uh, put together a book of this work, but that's really kind of much further down the line. Uh, but thank you for for your interest and in for asking. Um, and I also uh, well, we have a question. <laughs> okay. Uh, so from Nate, um, I'm glad you mentioned the sort of connection between your history pictures and the place of your birth, because then you first show those pictures, I immediately thought of the Plaza de la Tra cultures, uh, which is both ruin and building, but also then the site of the uh, Tlotelico massacre, which is now the site of a memorial as well. So yeah. curious if you can expand more on the role or consideration of a memorial as well in your work more broadly? That's a very um, interesting question. Um, I think that, um, yeah, that is very, very interesting. Um, I know that the Tlatelolco site, uh, my, um, and actually my, my father, who was in Mexico working on, on the Olympics in 1968, um, told me that he had he was driving past and remembers hearing noises during that, that time, but didn't realize what was going on. And of course, much of the news was uh, suppressed. Um, and uh, as, as far as memorializing these, these events, I mean, it can happen in so many different ways. I, I, I think for my, uh, in my case, um, the way that I've, I've attempted to do it has been through, through research and through finding out more of these, these histories. Um, and I see that kind of as a beginning. Um, and, and when I say research, I, I, I say it both in terms of um, uh, my own practice, which is a photographic uh, research of bringing uh, histories to visibility because otherwise people wouldn't be able to see many of these events uh, say 
uh, the destruction of traditional fabrics um, in in China or these 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 buildings which the the the, the Dula, which I I think of, do represent this kind of forgotten history, and um, and it's also in opportunities like this where um, where one, I can discuss this this work in a context that's different from say an exhibition um, uh, or even a, a book. Um, but all of these different way different uh, contexts are ways to kind of bring visibility to these histories um, that are really you know, largely forgotten um, that many people are, are unaware of and to start the discussion and to start the, um, the awareness um, that will hopefully lead to new kinds of ways of, of looking. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, because I, I also think like the food, I mean, your photographs, rather than categorizing them as like landscape photographs for me, like they are photographs of the ruins. So like not the ruins of not specific culture, but the ruins of like, like failed attempts or the ruins of like, like strong desire to have a, a, a single identity <laughs> as well. So like, I wonder like uh, how you position your your photographs of the buildings and the Seyab and Yalu uh, in the context of the, the, the ruins rather than like the, the photographs of architectural world buildings. Right. Um, I, I found that phot photographing um, ruins has been rather challenging um, because um, to photograph just just the ruins themselves, or the the, the rubble, um, is is in a way kind of a removal of of a context. Um, well, and I very much wanted to kind of um, contextualize them within a very specific uh, environment. So, in many of the the, the photographs, um, I've positioned um, elements that are still identifiable um, as very specific. Um, like, for example, you can see. Um, uh, say a, a corner house in, in Beijing that is uh, surrounded in the background by these new constructions. And that's the type of composition that I looked for in, in all the different areas. So it was uh, what kind of drove the composition between the bit behind the photograph in Shanghai and also the one in, in, in Xiamen. Um, to have both to show the specificity of the, the region but also to show that this is a um, uh, a larger phenomenon that's that is happening uh, consistently throughout many different different parts of, of the region. Um, so I, I was kind of very aware of that problem of how to photograph uh, ruins, but at the same time to be very uh, specific about what they were saying. Thank you. Like, I mean, personally, I remember I uh, joined your talk at the Museum of Modern Art many, many years ago as a grad student when you showed the photographs of Beijing and Shenzhen. And then I was wondering, like, uh, okay, then what would be the next project for this photographer? So beyond this uh, visualization of the rapidly uh, reshaping uh, landscape of China, under the development and then I and then say yeah <laughs> I found it wow that's really the path I never expected and I really want to um, uh, learn more about it and really expect uh, look forward to your forthcoming publications of this yeah. uh, project as well and also personally I wrote my dissertation on funerary portrait photography so I think we have to have more chances to discuss this topic further uh, as well so uh, thank you again for uh, sharing your wonderful project uh, with us today um, and, and also to the audience so we are going to have a lunch break for for around one and a half hour. And the afternoon session will start at 2 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. So I hope you could join uh, the rest of uh, the sessions uh, this afternoon too. And have a good uh, lunch break. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jihei, and thank you, everyone.